Greg, thanks very much. No problem. Uh, no problem. Thank, uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thanks for uh, asking me to, to give a lecture this evening. Pleasure. So, adventures in stone, landscape and character. Well, really, tonight I'm going to talk about three projects which link together and link together interest in stone, landscape and character. Um, and there's a bit of history, there's a bit of technical uh, information in terms of how you might build with stone and how stone has been used in the past. Uh, and then some basically some architectural design and approaches that utilize ancient techniques as inspiration for modern architecture. So it all started in Abo in 2005. And uh, we got involved in a project called Polinaria, which is an artist residency. Uh, and it combines art, agriculture, and science. And it's based on a farm in the Abruzzo region, which is uh, uh, basically central Italy on the Adriatic coast. And uh, through the sort of south side of that region from the Apennine Mountains. And part of our, our site is actually in the Grand Sasso National Park, and Grand Sasso begins rock. So it's, it's quite a mountainous region, um, and the site is located on a farm. Uh, this is the, these are some shots that we took uh, when I first stood there in 2005. So this is the sort of landscape that is in the Grand Sasso National Park. And our site in the, in the in sort of in the foothills. And you can see it's a very, it's actually a very inhospitable place, um, and they're, they're quite kind of an intimidating mountain range. Maybe not so much as the Alps and the Dolomites, but it's a very uh, inhospitable environment and uh, one in which the climate changes on a rapid basis. Well, there is, is a lot of stone, and, and this landscape has been occupied really since the uh, 8th and 9th centuries, and even prior to that, in some instances, by pagan cults. And we started studying the inhabitation of this landscape back in 2005 and found it very inspirational. And what you see here is a it's a hermitage that's built into the rock. Now, because the rocks are a type of limestone, they're, they're really quite soft. So you get these kind of wind-blown niches and caves and so on, which are created within the landscape, and then they've been inhabited by humans. And this is an example of a hermitage which would have been inhabited by monks. Uh, Really well from the eighth, eighth and ninth centuries, but right through to um, the seventeenth uh, and eighteenth century. Uh, they're no longer used; most of them are abandoned. Some have been designated kind of historic sites, so they're re re restored and red. red. Um, and you can see, the, see how this is built into the niche. So all of this stone would have been gathered locally. And then used to create the building, and really a hermitage is a, is a sort of an aeration on a, on a cave. Um, there's another shot of it here, so you can see the wind blown kind of niche that's created, and then the the hermitage is sort of slotted into it and built into it. This is a slightly more grand example. So it's a slightly more elaborate. Some of them are really elaborate. It's effectively a monastery, albeit on a small scale, but built into the side of a mountain. Um, most of them in very inhospitable places, very hard to get to, quite secluded. Um, and in addition to the land, it was occupied by other people who cultivated the land. 
so farmers and shepherds began to inhabit plateaus of the of the mountains and uh, whilst doing that and creating the land to be cultivated they would gather the stones that were loose in the fields and they would create these structures called tolos and these are quite remarkable buildings with a kind of dome-like structure inside and these were used for storing materials and tools but also for staying overnight if if the shepherd was there with his livestock he would create a kind of cradle out of sticks and leaves and uh, sort of suspend himself above the ground floor of the survival themselves and they would also build these stone walls which uh, were used for corralling livestock and kind of start to define the landscape really and organize the landscape so it's got inside so you've got these two sort of small windows which would have had wooden doors on and then the shot on the right hand side is a, a view looking directly up at the top of the dome um, so you can see the, the rocks kind of stacked on top of one another. It's a pretty remarkable feat to actually create these things, but they're extremely long, with it being a dome structure. You know, you can climb on top of them and stand, stand at the top quite happily. Now, this is outside of our site, but I just thought it would be interesting. I've traveled all over southern Italy and I've witnessed these kind of revised constructions in many different parts of Italy. It's not just an it's not just something that's exclusive to Abruzzo. And these very similar dome structures are called trulli. And you find these in Puglia, which is Rahil of uh, Italy, the sort of Achilles tendon in the heel. And uh, these are slightly elaborate, slightly more refined, but again, built with dry stone walling, very few tools. Um, and then in this case, it's covered in a kind of rough stucco, which sticks it all together. And they're often white in, uh, in Puglia. And really the best and most extraordinary example of uh, of the truly is where they're used to create a kind of become a housing typology and they're spread all over the hill in which the town sits and they're really quite extraordinary and you'll see some of them have symbols painted on them and these are sometimes pagan sometimes christian symbols so very often there'll be uh, religious buildings within this kind of collection of, uh, of structures on 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 the hill now Barabello is is a unesco world heritage site it's a very unique place. it's extraordinary really well worth a visit the other place that's worth looking at with an inhabited landscape which again is in southern Italy it has very strong correlations with what's happening in Abruzzo or what was was happening in Abruzzo and this is the city of Matera which was the city of culture in 2019 um, and this is a city that's built entirely out of the rock and really began its life in the 10th millennium BC, so about 12,000 years ago, people were inhabiting this landscape and they were living in caves. And believe it or not, that happened up until really the, the mid 20th century. In the 1950s, uh, when Matera was sort of rediscovered, um, it was inhabited by a population that were living in poverty and it was considered to be the shame of Italy. That was how the newspapers described it at the time. And the whole place, 16,000 people who used to live there with families of six to eight people living in the caves um, were relocated to another town. Now, since that's happened, 
you can see now that the development of the town since the 50s has kind of built up on the top. So there's a series of layers to the bottom. You've got these caves, which people used to live in, now are extremely popular as Airbnb uh, uh, Airbnb rentals and very popular with tourists. Um, which is pretty extraordinary. You know, everybody wants to live like a troglodyte, which is not a not a derogatory term in in Matera. Uh, but you can see the kind of layering of the urban structure. Uh, so right on top, you've got the kind of modern 20th century buildings, and then you, you gradually come down, and you can see the caves. And right at the bottom, you've got the ones which were probably occupied first. Um, so there's this kind of air cave going on. This is a shot from the hillside. So you can see the uh, there's a new urban landscape that follows the topography of, the, of its surroundings. And it's very dramatic. Um, and not, not dissimilar to the sorts of inhabitations you might find in Turkey or North Africa. So that's a, that's a little aside, but that kind of gives you a, a few reference points. Now, our site in Abruzzo was actually a 134 hectare farm, which was used for growing olives and grapes, uh, and still is. Um, and it was inherited by our client, and he he decided to turn it into an organic farm begin with and then eventually an artist residency program was begun and that is still in existence now still working with them um where the red circle is, is is the first sort of installation that we started working on and that's the one i'm going to talk about but there are actually three farmhouses there's one in the center here where my mouse is kind of circling and then another one over to the far right in this location here In the red circle, this was the operational farm. The other two were uh, ruins uh, and uh, had been abandoned probably 30 years ago. But you can see from the contours, it's quite a kind of, uh, it's quite a, a kind of uh, varied topography and it follows a series of streams that run through the valley. So the whole farm sits within the valley effectively. Um, right. This is view from that main farmhouse site. So you're looking across uh, the other farmhouse is way down here, at the bottom of the valley, and this track leads you to all three farmhouses. It links them all together. Now we produced a ten-year master plan, which they've partly followed. And it was all about creating interconnectivity, creating spaces for artists to sleep and live and work in the kind of in the landscape and be inspired by it. And really the artist residency itself, the the approach is to try and bring together the science of organic farming with with art and create a kind of a hybrid um, artistic approach generates work that's really born from the site and and the kind of agricultural activities that take take place near, nearby so there are three key buildings on on this first site this is the farmhouse which was restored this is it sort of work in progress and there were two concrete 1950s barns which were in very prominent positions and overlooked Site. Originally, we were thinking of removing them, but then we realized that they were a kind of a resource that we could utilize. So when we began working on the project, we produced this um, our concept model. And really what it was exploring was how we could introduce new programs to the site and how we could organize the landscape around the buildings in order to create new spaces so we could create a kind of an amphitheater between the farmhouse at the top left and this barn below it 
uh, and there's a kind of natural drop in topography which sort of lent itself to the bar being a backdrop or projector screen for a kind of an amphitheater then we also needed to accommodate a, a cafe a shop artist studios which were located on the south side over here and then the barns became a uh, partly an archive partly still for agriculture use so there's a combination of things and trying to bring a balance to um the two program programs really the farm itself and the artist residency as well i'm trying to do that in a kind of a, a safe and sensible manner so if you remember the organizing walls of the tolos you know guiding livestock and uh, and kind of defining the landscape that's what we've tried to do here so these kind of brown cardboard strips were, were representing these kind of um dry stone walls that were going to organize the site and allow uh, new buildings to be created within the landscape but also create kind of um, places in which we could bring new constructions in, into the uh, into the mix of buildings. That's got simplified. So this this diagram really looks at the components that we ended up with. I mean, partly the budgetary constraints and sort of a dose of realism about what was actually achievable. Um, so we've got a series of components here. We've got the farmhouse. We've got the cafe and shop. We had a new building, which was this court end block which was going to be the office. And we had the two barns one with the projections and one with sort of artist studios and archive inside it. And then we had this kind of stepped landscape to create the amphitheater and deal with the level changes. And then the, these black bits are the kind of retaining walls or the, the kind of a dry stabling that would start to define the landscape, create the niches for the buildings, and so on. And then this is a this is a model which kind of makes it a little bit clearer what's going on. Really, so you've got the two barns here, and then the office building in the middle with the court end steel, and then the cafe and shop, and then the original farmhouse. And you can see these pieces of steel represent the walls so when we went from that model down to really a series of three walls which ran through the site and organized it we also looked at various things like the approach to the buildings as well so the original approach was on this uh, kind of western side we were bringing people in to the middle of the site with parking and so on. Anticipation was this was going to be quite an attraction locally. Here's the photo up as well. So you've got the cafe building just here, and then the office building again. Here's a few visuals. So this is a view from the top of the cafe looking down at the amphitheater and the projection of Metropolis on screen. This is the cafe. Or rather the cafe in the shop with the office building on the right hand side. These are collages really. Uh, you can see the Grand Sasso uh, mountains beyond. The view. Okay, so that's that's the Bruzzo, and that and sadly that project, we're still working on it. We're working on it at a very sort of small and discrete capacity, producing some designs for artists, uh, what we call sanctuaries that uh, sit in the landscape. Some of the work has been done, um, but nothing major, unfortunately. When we working on the project uh, in 2008 uh, we were just about to submit planning applications and then the earthquake hit in uh, L'Aquila 
and uh, all the funding that we were due to get got redistributed to um, earthquake emergency funds, which obviously was absolutely necessary, but uh, was unfortunate for our client. Um, but that's the way things go in architecture sometimes. So when we went to the man, we, we met our clients in the other man who were very keen to kind of build a, a nature reserve and a house on a site that they were looking at. And um, there were some immediate kind of connections between what we saw on the Isle of Man and what we saw in Abruzzo. And I'll explain how that worked now. The project's called the Restorative Retreat for Sartfell. You might be familiar with it. It's had quite a lot of press. Uh, this is the house as it is at the moment. So you've got this kind of dry stone structure, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, and it's quite a distinctive shape, which I'll also explain as it kind of, it re it's really born the landscape, but it's also born from the climate, I think, which is quite a key aspect of the form of the building. This is the Isle of Man, known for the TT races. It's also known when you go on the island, you'll notice there are all these kind of white cottages that are dotted all over the island, and they're quite a key heritage asset on the island. And uh, there's a very strong movement to preserve them. This, this landscape itself, so there's a couple of shots here to give you a sense of it. And the site or the whole island is a UNESCO World Biosphere, so it's a protected uh, biosphere and it's considered to be quite unique on, on, on the planet, really, um, in the UK. That's some quite unusual flora, flora and fauna. Uh, these are the clients, Peter and Carol, and uh, they're sort of semi-retired, but their ambition was to create a house that blended with the landscape and, and uh, kind of worked with the landscape to create a nature reserve, which could be enjoyed by local school children and local study groups. A very strong connection to the local wildlife trust, the Manx Wildlife Trust as well. And they're both educators um, and from a sort of science background. Uh, Peter is, in fact, a bee neurologist, so he understands how bees think, which is a pretty fascinating subject when you start talking to him about it. They found us uh, after seeing this house, which is a sort of concept project we produced for a site in Sumatra. Uh, and it's inspired by the nests of orangutans. This is one of only two places in the world where orangutans live. Um, and the building was really uh, kind of connected when they saw it, and they uh, so they were kind of so uh, on board with the approach that we took with this project that they decided to commission it for their house, which we're very pleased about. So the site, if you can see that little red dot in the middle of the island, that site, it's not too far from the coast, quite central. And you can see from the aerial photograph, the cultivated areas near the sea, and then gradually, as you get closer to the centre and the more sort of mountainous parts of the, the island, it becomes more like uh, more land, really. This is the site. Side of the house, we've got Sartfell Mountain, which is this big slope up to the right-hand side. And you'll notice... Whilst this land is cultivated, it's defined by these. These are actually um, dry stone walls. So quite, uh, it's a very common organisational tool on the island. So 
Oops. 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 So you can see, sorry, that's not working very well. Um, so one of the things that's very dramatic on the island is the weather, which comes in very, very quickly. Uh, you can see this is a site photograph. This is typical of the conditions that the building was being built in. You can see the preserved cottage on the right hand side. And then the face of the ground floor, which we're just going in at that time. This is an example of uh, one of the trees. You frequently see trees like this. So the wind isn't sort of intermittent, it's constant. And uh, it, it's kind of relentlessly windy, really. And that's a key feature of the climate there. Uh, and you can see how everything adapts to that. Even the livestock adapt to it, um, and this tree is certainly adapted adapted to it. One of the things that we did when we started the project was we put a weather station on the site to collect data, and it was on site for about a year. And then we fed all that data back to the environmental engineers, um, who were then able to kind of develop a strategy for the building to become a zero carbon building in operation. Uh, it also, you know, things like the, uh, the the wind the wind direction started to de define the architecture as well, and obviously things like sun path and thinking about solar gain and how we could utilize that heating the building. These were all considerations when we started designing. So this is a shot of the site as it was. So at the front, we've got this flat area, which was a menage for training horses. That is all now gone. That's all been regraded and reseeded naturally. So just windblown seeds have um, started to uh, populate that land. And you can see with the cottage, it had a lot of extensions on the back of it. The cottage itself is about 65 square meters. And there were lots of extensions which were pretty ugly stuck on the back of, of the cottage. So one of the things we wanted to do was restore the cottage back to its original form. So it was a more faithful example. And then this is an area of and then this is the proposed plan. So here you can see the menage. The horses that's all gone and then we've got various barns dotted around there's a garage here just next to the house and then the cottage itself so what we ended up with was we had these organizing walls these draw dry stone walls which are echoes of a brutzo really which then wrap around and define the, the house itself and create a kind of backdrop for the cottage as well that was the idea then we'd have this linking piece that would link the new extension to the house to the cottage itself. And over here, to the left hand side, we had a visitor centre. Now, one of the reasons we got planning permission for the house itself was that this was a, an educational uh, project and it was also uh, one that was in a, a commercial project and one that would create a level of tourism the cottage would also provide accommodation for tourists and that's something that uh, the Isle of Man are very keen to promote and this was a key part of, of our planning application so when we applied for planning for the house we had to apply for planning for the visitor centre at the same time 
the two things were kind of inseparable. Here's another view. This is a wider view. So this starts to starts to show you the extent of the um, the proposed nature reserve. So all this land is going to be left uh, left to nature and uh, managed on a very minimal level and monitored by the Manx Wildlife Trust. And again, this was a key part of the planning application. It's a key. Um, Kind of attraction for the planners. This was a, a survey that was carried out to identify the species on the site. So this was carried out by the Manx Wildlife Trust and they've given a lot of guidance on how to improve the biodiversity. This is their comp this is their proposed master plan in its kind of raw form, if you like. So they describe all the different species of insects, butterflies, um, the, the fauna, and also the uh, the flora as well, and what they're hoping to achieve by doing that. We've done this with other projects as well. So we create what's called a biodiversity budget and uh, provide a methodology and a prediction of what sorts of species might be attracted to the site uh, and re-established. Sometimes they can be quite unusual uh, and even rare. So on this particular site we've got a lot of rare orchids because of the conditions that are being created or have been created over the last two years. This is, the, this is a kind of workshop with the Manx Wildlife Trust. We did this in partnership with the Modern House State Agency as well. They came out to have a look at the house and spent a weekend there working with the Manx Wildlife Trust in the landscape. This is them again. Here's a shot of them taking in the landscape on top of the new house. So the roof of the new house is a green roof, but this was left, it was not planted so the the whole thing is populated by seeded, naturally seeded, wind-blown plants. So it took time to establish. It took about two seasons really to get to get going. And now the reason for that is that there's no opportunity to introduce a, a kind of an alien species to the site, um, and the wind-blown seeds are completely natural and come from the surrounding. Uh, countryside. So this is uh, an example of some dry stone construction, which is very typical on the island. And one of the things that is that it kind of gets populated, gets kind of taken over by the landscape itself. So the nooks and crannies that are created in the wall are really a haven for insects and for plants. Um, and we wanted to encourage that kind of behaviour in our in our project. Here's an example of a, an old uh, stone-built cottage very close to the site. So again, another diagram just to explain how the walls work. So we've got our preserved cottage at the bottom there with the extensions removed. And then we created this series of walls, which I mentioned earlier, which kind of organize the site and create the building. And right at the top, we've got this, uh, we've got a library in the center, which is this staircase here. And then right at the top, we've got this kind of viewing, uh, it's almost like a light box with the office in it, and it's a kind of an observatory. I mean, in fact, the whole building is like an observatory, really, because we've got this very long linear window that faces out to the valley and is brilliant if you're a bird watcher, which our clients are. This is a, a 3D model that we, we produced uh, to begin with, and we produced a series of different options. This is a different approach the building 
we often provide different options to clients um, in order to explore ideas, but also to examine the kind of impact of the building on the landscape. So we create some pretty big models, both physical and three-dimensional, in order to kind of accurately assess the design. So this is the building itself. So there's a series of kind of levels. This is the ground floor. So you've got the cottage here with it with the very thick walls, and you can see how tiny it is. It's quite a quite a compact building. And then we've got a, a dining room which connects the cottage to the extension. And then here we've got the library in the center, which has a staircase running all the way through it, which is what we call the kind of the brain of the building. So all the, the knowledge is stored here. Then you've got an open plan living kitchen dining area with this long linear window which faces south and this not only allows views but it also is carefully controls the sunlight so we we benefit from some solar gain and then this projecting window on the uh, west side frames a view out to the coast and at the back, we've got a, a garage for two cars, yeah, and a kind of utility space. And then I think one of the loveliest parts of the building is this area here with the big tree, which is a sort of sheltered garden. If you remember the, the tree and the wind, this is a kind of sheltered spot that you can enjoy. And beyond it, we've got a greenhouse, which again is defined by another wall. So here we've got a couple of views of the cottage as restored with the uh, with the new house behind it. And you can see how it kind of blends in. So it just the, the dry stone walls kind of recede and the cottage is presented as it should be. On the lower image you can start to see that a, a bit more clearly. And then here we've got the uh, the glass kind of observatory on the top. We'll see if this video works. Yeah. This is the different view, view heading from the south towards the building. The sink there between the two buildings, the sort of indoor landscape. So this was taken two and a half years ago before the landscape really had opportunities to regenerate. Um, um, so now it looked very different, very, very different. So this is a repeat of the previous plan, really. Um, I'll show you some views of the inside. So this is the, the kind of the brain of the building, so the knowledge center that sits in the middle and the, the kind of precision staircase. We, we wanted something that was going to filter the light from the sort of the viewing deck at the top. all the way down through the building. So rather than using glass, we decided to use uh, steel. We've seen much more in keeping with the aesthetic of the building. We also wanted a crafted element that um, had a had a sort of handcrafted feel to it, which runs through the whole building really. So you can see the uh, the sort of knowledge center, and you can see the light above coming down from the um, from the office at the top. This is the main living space. Uh, 
There's a lot of detail and texture as well that's given by the kind of railings or the, the sort of balustrading on the staircase and the, the exposed joists on the roof. And then you've got the facade itself. It's an all concrete interior. So you've got a concrete floor and a concrete exposed wall on the interior. We had an island unit that was commissioned from um, an artisan that we work with. And then we've got the lower, lower. Oh, sorry, this is the office level. So um, you can see the triangle there, and then you've got two bedrooms in the cottage on the top floor. This is climbing up through the knowledge kind of centre up to the office. Got a view of the office on the right hand side. It's glazed all the way around. It's just held up by five columns, five steel columns. You can actually climb out on the roof here. In the lower level, we've got the bedrooms. So there are two bedrooms and a kind of open plan gallery space. utility spaces down here as well you can also walk out onto the landscape on the south side so you've got these two doors here again this is all buried into the ground so you've got a sort of concrete retaining wall and then the dry stone walling around here and i can explain exactly how that was built in a second these are the bedrooms they're all naturally lit even though they're built into the ground Can see the filtering of the staircase here this is a building from the sort of the valley below you've got the long ribbon window that wraps around the this is the view from it it's easy to see why they wanted to build a house here it's an extraordinary view Peter taking advantage of the view, doing some bird watching. Here you can see the kind of ribbon window with the kind of core 10 steel, uh, core 10 steel uh, window frames, or sort of sills and soffits. We had to think quite carefully about how steel was. Otherwise, it's so uh, relentless. So it's either windy or rainy or, or both most of the time, sunny occasionally. But it's unforgiving. So you have to detail the building to an incredibly high standard. And we took a lot of local advice on how to do that effectively. That's a window looking out to the, uh, to the coastal view. And from the kitchen window, you can look up the mount up to the top of Sartfell Mountain and into the uh, the garden at the back. And this is Peter enjoying the, the garden at the back outside the kitchen. So you can see the roof becoming populated. And you'll notice the, um, the sort of dry stone wall, which is sort of half bedded. So it creates a, a niche for things to kind of collect in and germinate. Another view up to the top of the mountain from the office. So the staircase was actually built in Somerset in sections. And then uh, and it's precision made. An enormous amount of thought went into how it was going to be constructed and built. And uh, so much so that we won an award for it last year at the AJ Specification Awards. Little shot of the building behind the cottage.
Um, this is the southern view. This is a section just showing how the building has sort of dropped into the ground. So we had the retaining walls here with waterproofing behind the retaining walls. And basically the wall construction is a is a kind of a very big cavity wall. So you've got a 200 millimeter thick concrete in a wall, 100 mil of insulation, and then a, um, a cavity membrane. And then the stonework itself, which was tied back to the uh, concrete wall. Now all the stone that was used on the, on the project was actually harvested from the site. So when we dug out for the basement levels, we used the stones that were gathered and found whilst excavating to, um, to provide the padding to the walls. This is the uh, sort of central space where the staircase was going being constructed. Sort of the staircase model. So the whole thing was modelled. We had site, site measurements which were then fed into Rhino and then we produced this model which was then replicated by the fabricators in reality. This is a sort of strategy for environmental, uh, the sort of environmental approach. So we had things like creating wind shelters, triple glazed windows. We even had we had biomass boiler, wind energy, the green roof, solar thermal panels, and a ground source heat pump. So that all came together to create a building that was zero carbon in operation. There's a few diagrams. So one of the things we did on the site in the nature reserve was create a lake into which we used a ground source heat pump to provide the underfloor heating. We also had an MVHR system. And then natural ventilation as well. So the, the section of the building was designed with that in mind. So the, the, the kind of stacked staircase void created kind of natural stack in stack ventilation. And then this was uh, all about solar gain and um, thinking about how big the overhangs of the roof needed to be, uh, how we could kind of maximize it without overheating, this kind of thing. All these calculations were done by the environmental engineer. And we also had a borehole for providing fresh water. So um, that was something else that we had to kind of accommodate in the scheme itself. So it's pretty self-sufficient building. And this is the biodigester, which treats all the waste from the building. Which you can't see, buried under the ground. And just a few shots of the of the visitor center that's proposed, and this is supposed to be getting built this year. Now this has a slightly different aesthetic. It's more of a a, a kind of um, a building, a temporary building in in many ways on the in the landscape. So it sits in a niche that was that is created by dry stone walling again. The model we built in the office. That was featured at the, the Royal Academy a couple of years ago. This is it in context. So this is the next site. I'm pretty quickly. I'm aware that I'm going to get to an hour and I'm going to ten minutes. And, uh, so this is a looking site Cornwall. It's Penrith. Um, this is a project that we got planning for very recently. And it's what I would describe as Neolithic modernism. And you'll, you'll see why. This is another ancient landscape. It's very close to the end of the uh, to the end of Cornwall, the um, land's end, in a place called Portheris Cove. You can see the site here in red. You 
it's a pretty remote site. Um, you know, it's, uh, the, the existing house is circled in red. Um, and uh, you've got a couple of different landscapes here, really. But the cultivated elements of the landscape, you can see, are defined by this kind of coaxial field system, which has been in existence for thousands of years. This is a very, very ancient landscape. This is the existing house. This is a view from the beach at Port Harris Cove. You can see it's quite a it's prominent and discreet at the same time, really. This is the house, the existing house, which is pretty ugly. Um, and it's staggering to, to think it ever got built in the first place. On top of which, it doesn't really face the view. But it's in a quite a prominent location. You've got the southwest coastal path just to the north, uh, which links a series of different bits of activity. So you've got fishermen, fishermen's huts and Pendine Watch Lighthouse as well. So here's the site in the centre. You've got this kind of prehistoric enclosed land hat all the way around it. So this has been populated, as I said, for a very, very long time. This is the site plan itself. So we had an archaeologist do a study on the site. And the colours represent the kind of significance of the different parts of the land. So they considered the, the, the main part of the site to be of very high significance. It's what's known locally as sacred ground. So it's essentially forbidden to, uh, to build anything on it. So you can maintain it, but you can't build in it. And uh, the unknown element is a sort of buffer zone around the house, which was advised we wouldn't or shouldn't build on. And the green section is really the driveway and the kind of immediate surroundings around the house itself, which um, which were considered low significance. This is the coaxial field system, and this is a diagram just showing how we reoriented our building as well. I'll show you how we did that in a, in a second. But um, we wanted to work with the coaxial field system, and the existing building doesn't really doesn't do that. The site might plan. It's kind of like working against the geometry of the site itself. So one of the things that uh, this part of Cornwall is very well known for is uh, these point structures, which is the name they're given colloquially. And um, these are megalithic constructions, and they're really a fundamental part of the architectural distinctiveness of Pest West Penrith, where these are being constructed sort of in the early Neolithic period, which is about 3,500 BC. And uh, many of these coits are located in pretty prominent areas. Uh, so locations with panoramic views, incorporating high hills, rivers, or coastal features. And this reflects the desire to define or control a specific territory and to bring the community into a closer relationship with it. So it's almost like a signposting of landscape features. And many of these landscape features maybe fe became part of community histories or enjoyed a particular mythical association. And some of them other constructions, sometimes with caves uh, and subterranean elements, were called cromleks. And these are sort of common or burial places, uh, often built in the Neolithic period. So, kind of, uh, with, there would have been sort of pagan burial rituals associated with these. 
And this is Gulval, which is an Iron Age settlement. Um, and it was occupied 3,000 years ago and is one of the best examples in the country of its type. So the village was made up of these kind of stone walled homesteads known as courtyard houses. They're only found on the Land's End Peninsula and the Isles of Scilly. And the houses line a kind of village street. And each had an open central courtyard surrounded by a number of thatched rooms. There's a very from here of what it might have been like when it was occupied. So you can see the kind of thatched roofs on top. So surprisingly, a large amount of it has been preserved. Now, Cornwall also has a rich kind of industrial heritage, um, not just in mining, but um, you know, wool cloth manufacturing, quarrying, quarrying and shipbuilding, and even uh, China clay quarrying as well. But probably the, the element of the heritage that survived and kind of de define the landscape in many ways is is the tin mining and this is a local tin near penrith you can see there are bits of it missing so things like the the mine head or the pit head uh, and all the kind of timber elements are missing so a big combination of stone and timber in order to construct these kind of sites for operation Two things went hand in hand. And this is a Cornishman's house. Um, and these are kind of bayed houses, uh, which are kind of linked together with a staircase in the center. So there's a hall in the center. This is a plan, it's not a very good uh, resolution image, but you can see the hallway in the plan. The, the main entrance and then you have these kind of rooms off it to create this kind of cruciform plan. Now these buildings were quite sophisticated at the time and probably uh, Cornwall had some of the most technically advanced builders in the UK when they were building these buildings and they developed the complex kind of upper crock roof which is a sort of timber construction to create a almost like a gothic arch roof on these houses that's the structure inside so they were quite sophisticated so going back to our site in the house this is a a cardboard model that we produced so this is looking up from the beach at the house itself so as I said before, you know, we use models a lot to kind of examine the impact of a building, kind of sell the idea to the planners, not just to the client. These are examples of iterations that um, we developed. You can see some of them are quite, quite kind of crazy ideas, really, uh, sort of... Um, you know, kind of Lord's Media Centre type buildings or clams, and maybe some coits here as well. So we we looked at lots of different forms, but the, the driving force behind that was minimizing the impact visually from the the southwest coastal path, which was a, a kind of critical element of the project, really, in order to sell it to the planners. So again, you know, we built this giant model that was about three meters in each direction of cardboard. If you look at our Instagram feed, you can see uh, it get, getting built. So this is the original house. There's a of different models, so there's a few different iterations here just to show Very technical here. Actually. Just a straight the form of the building might influence its impact.
So you can see some different forms here. And this this one's quite interesting because this this is when we started looking at the quoits again, thinking about how the roof could be developed. It's this kind of floating element sat on these kind of heavy stone pillars with this kind of timber base underneath. And you'll see what I mean as we move forward. So we developed this concept for the building, which was it brought all different heritage of the we used sorry greg we're sort of we're sort of losing you a bit there for some reason we can't you're breaking up a bit okay i'm not sure why not here, so. um, um. And we've got the elevation as well, which shows the kind of timber and the kind of infilling of the glazing. We had problems with kind of we're in a dark skies area, so we had to kind of carefully control how that was going to be affected. And the staircase was really influenced by the the uh, Cornish typology. Sorry, my laptop's paused at the moment. Yeah, we lost we lost your sound there totally for a minute. <clears throat> oh, I did anyway. Oh, really? Okay. So we we built this model to demonstrate how the building kind of came to. Building would be designed and be a ruin in, say, a thousand years. It's just like the tip, all the timber elements would perish, and what we'd be left with was this sort of dramatic, quite like structure that was simply three, with three, with three columns. So this this is the house as it was. It's has actually developed further. You can see the stone elements holding up the roof. Yeah. And here and here. And then we've got this very thin post tensioned roof. And the idea behind the whole building was that we would end up with a situation where we didn't need any concrete at all. And we would build all the foundations in stone as well as the structure. So this is the building as a ruin. Um, so you can see the columns of stone and the roof as well, which was very, very thin. We wanted to make it as thin as possible. So it had this kind of dramatic uh, poise to it. Here's a series of images which show in context. So you can see this is a sort of thing to do. Hi, Greg. Yeah, would you, your, your voice is really breaking up a lot. We're not, it's difficult to. We're not getting you there for some reason. Uh,
So you can see the difference picture. This is the approach to the house. Um, so we've got, I mean, we've got a much bigger building, but visually from the key viewpoints, it's not any bigger at all. In fact, it's smaller. You can see the height of the building we've brought to a lower level to really kind of reduce its prominence. A series of ele elevations now. So this is this is the design that actually got planning. So we've got the stone column at the front and the and the uh, the stone roof, which has this sort of populated brown uh, and stone roof. So it's a sort of not quite a green roof, but something that blends in with the landscape. And we've got these timber elements, which are much more lightweight to create the accommodation on the ground floor. And these kind of steel fins, which are going to reduce the light pollution, but still provide a view. So these are the elevations. And again, you know, we've got this stone niche. So this is sort of naturally created. Well, not naturally created, but it's 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 not really an organized wall as such, more like a rubble acting as a retaining wall we're creating a backdrop for the house and this is on the north side so we've got these very big stone elements here exits of stone wall and then this is the roof so the idea here was that we would populate the roof with fragments of rock as well as planting it up I'll quickly take you through the plan. So you've got the hall, which is a sort of central north element. And then we've got the, the, the sort of wing of bedrooms and then the kind of utility space. And then we've got this covered area for cars, which sit underneath next to the porch at the front. And really, we wanted to hide the cars. So we didn't want them on show. And we also didn't want them kind of acting as reflectors in the landscape. And Kind of signaling their presence. Upstairs, there's a kind of open plan kitchen, dining, living space. You can see the fins here, kind of controlling the light spillage. On the south side, but also controlling the solar gain. And we've got a terrace on the east and west ends a very large sort of fireplace element here so you can see the stone elements gray so there are four of those and then this is a this is a diagram from the engineers so the engineer on this project is steve webb now he's a real advocate of using stone and stone is uh, as a material has maybe 10 percent of the carbon footprint of steel and concrete and if you start using local stone, which we're intending to do here, uh, it's even less than that. So it's significantly less impact and it's recyclable. Um, so it's a very low impact material. So the intention here with the roof is that we it is perched on these sort of stone, <coughs> stone walls, but um, it's post tension. So what that means is that it's cut into a series of slabs which is the isometric drawing. And then they're connected together with a series of um, almost, if you were doing it in joinery, you'd describe them as biscuits. In here, they can connect all the slabs together. And then you post tension it by running cables through it and then tightening them up. So the whole thing is this grid of stone slabs. Each one of these is about. 1200 square and the post tensioning section is about 150 millimeters thick you can see that here on the sectional diagram Seems so you, you, sorry go on do you post do you post tension it in one lot and then heave it up or what how do you how would you build that uh, you would have to put in a sort of temporary uh, support structure 
lay it all out flat and then post tension it on site. Okay, thanks. Um, but I mean, this diagram shows you that you've got this, these kind of stone sections. So you've got the stone wall here at the front, and then you've got the stone staircase element at the back. And then the post tension roof spans right the way across. I mean, Steve Webb reckons you can span up to about 12 meters with post tension stone. Obviously, it kind of varies depending on the thicknesses, but. Um, He's, he's a big advocate of it. And if you went to his exhibition at the building center, you would have seen an example of that. And you've got the kind of timber infill underneath. So it's a kind of timber frame structure underneath that forms the ground floor. And uh, because we're in a radon gas area, we have to have a radon sump underneath the building. So we couldn't put a concrete floor in anyway unless we had a radon uh, sort of capture system underneath it. So the idea is we have a suspended timber floor here, which is well ventilated, and we, we kind of collect the gas in a sump. Uh, and that is it for those three projects. Thank you so much, Greg. And has anyone got any? Anyone got some? Oh, there's some questions. Scott, you got a question here. Scott, do you, maybe do you want to ask it, or do you want me to read it out? You're being a bit shy. Um. Okay. So, so Scott, it's Scott's mic's intermittent. So Scott's asking um, for the Isle of Man house. Was the embodied carbon measured uh, with particular reference to the use of in situ? Concrete. What is your view of the balance in, uh, in importance between operational energy and embodied uh, embodied car carbon? Sorry. Uh, well, I think um, when we started that project back in 2013, our knowledge was admittedly not as great as it is now. So I think we would do it quite differently in many ways. Um, I mean, one of the problems we were kind of struggling with there was the, the ground conditions. So concrete is something, in order to kind of create a building that was in the landscape, literally in the landscape, we needed to use concrete as, as a way of, uh, of doing that. So um, we didn't measure the embodied energy. I'd love to know what it was uh, or what, what it is. And... Um, yeah, it's maybe something we should do now. We're in post-occupation and really study what's happening with the building in operation as well. I mean, the intention was that the embodied energy or the embodied carbon in the construction would be offset by the amount of energy that was created on site. So we were hoping to be selling energy back to the grid um, to to create some kind of offset and mm -hmm. also there's also the carbon carbon capture that's created by the uh, nature reserve itself so the kind of restoration of the land around the site itself would also uh, contribute to, to that offset i think if we were doing it now from from what i know now we would probably be looking at concrete if we if we had to use concrete, which I think we would for the same design, I don't think we're getting away from it, but you, know, you can at least use pozzolanic ash to reduce your carbon footprint with the concrete. Um, and I, th I think, uh, you know, there are other ways of maybe creating the building that's nestled in the landscape. So, you know, maybe creating a a retaining wall behind the building and having a gap between the building and the retaining wall is another methodology for doing it, which is what we're doing in Cornwall. I mean, the driving force behind the design in Cornwall was to get rid of concrete, so not rely on it in any form at all. Okay. And we've managed to achieve that. So. And, and you think that is achievable? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, we you know we can have blocks of stone that are placed into the into trenches around the perimeter to build the timber frame walls 
and to create the foundations for the for the stone elements and then we can have a suspended timber floor underneath um and uh you know do it in a more sort of traditional manner you know i mean concrete so it is you know until very very recently it's the go-to material for almost everything so you know architects don't think anything of putting a concrete slab in a, in a terraced victorian house when actually they've always had earth floors with a suspended timber floor above yeah. and as long yeah. as it's well ventilated it's it's a perfectly reasonable way of constructing a building i, I wanted to ask about your um I mean, you're clearly very interested in vernacular uh, on local architecture and, or, and, and construction. And yeah. I just I wonder whether you could just say something about that to the students in terms of how, how you how, how you how use that. Sorry, as a... You know, how useful is a kind of inspiration or technically how useful that is for you? Um, well, I think... Um, there's a number of reasons for being interested in it, really. I mean, the first is that when you look at an, uh, 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 an environment that's been inhabited before, seeing how people have constructed their own architecture in that environment gives you a lot of clues as to what the problems are going to be. You know, when you're when you're designing a new building. Um, uh, yeah. understanding how, you know, how the environment operates and that, and that kind of thing i think also it's all is you know for us it's about telling a story sure. with the building so how it links into the, end of the site and how it kind of tells the next chapter if you like of that site is something that we're interested in you know i, I think we're definitely modern architects but i think understanding the link between now the future and the past is quite critical in um you know producing a convincing piece of architecture i think and and it's also a, a brilliant tool to sell a project to the planners i mean the, the house in cornwall we had the support of the local mp we had a lot of people on board for what is a pretty um you know aesthetically it's quite a bold building and certainly in many ways extremely different to other other buildings locally you know other modern buildings locally um, but it has these connections to the past which is something that was really of interest to, to the planners and the heritage consultant and the landscape consultant yes but it has a connection to the past but Informed by its, um, it's informed by its environment. So, it is, yeah. Which it, which it seems, which seems contextual. And I mean, it's funny. I, um, Gianni, um, in a way, made made a similar uh, argument for a project that he'd done in West London, which was a was an mm. odd looking, and it because and it didn't look like the next. But he was, he said, it was designed around letting sunlight into the building so it was actually designed for its location but so it was very specifically yeah. designed for its there um Absolutely. so i think it's a, it's a really interesting way of of not arguing but just of, of articulating the reasons for a project um look saying thank you for a, a brilliant set of projects um and scott's asking what was your introduction to the the first project in italy what was how did how did that come about well we um we actually designed a house in namibia which uh, was a kind of common project and uh, it got published in wallpaper magazine in 2005 and that client after having seen it in wallpaper magazine dropped me an email and from that point onwards but at first i was i just didn't think it was uh, going to come to anything. So I kept pressing, pre pressing the client for information. He kept sending me information. 
within a month we went out there on site and we just got on really well so we kind of grew from when he's there. still a good friend now um and you know we enjoy spending time together wandering around the landscape which is which is great and we, we've just started working with him again on a, on a new installation for artists to use on in in that landscape so um you know sometimes these things take a you know it takes a long time to come to fruition um but it, you've got to be persistent absolutely um, any more are there any any more questions from students comments observations we're very quiet out there right this is this is normally if you were sitting in a room this is when you corner someone and look at them and get them to ask it but i can't do that um but look, thank, thank, thanks so much greg for it was really nice to see the projects and 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 really interesting that you're this the kind of stone things interesting and it's kind of new to me that this is suddenly um is being kind of, i mean i saw the exhibition last year at the building center which was fascinating but um and it, but it's a yeah. it's, it's a real you know and it's in there's a lot of it around i mean stone and uh so why not use it and i mean of course it's it's the material that's used to make concrete at great expense environmentally why not use it in its raw form i suppose Absolutely, yeah. well as, as steve webb say, says you know you take a material that's uh, you know, got a strength of 220 kilonewtons, and you turn it into a material that's got a strength of 40 kilonewtons. It's and waste a lot of energy in the process doing so. So, <laughs> that's very good. Well, look, well, look, bonkers. Um, well, look, thanks. Thank, thank you very much. And and I that's know okay. that we'll, we will get some, we will get questions from students following up and. And certainly there was a couple of slides that I, I would love to uh, ask you to if you could if we could borrow or or steal sure. so um i will i will you know but um but thanks again R really appreciate it R very nice that's okay i mean people, people can just drop us a line that's not a problem at all i'm be more than happy to answer questions and uh, if you let me know which slides are of interest i can send them over Terrific. Thanks. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you and thanks to everyone for listening. Great. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Everyone's saying thank you. And just saying thank you. Well, th thanks very much, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Uh,